My name is Jolene Versteeg. I've been attending Gateway my whole life, 41 years. Um, norm I serve on the tech team, so normally I'm behind the camera or up in the booth uh, running video production. I also teach in Kids Church, and I'm a GEMS leader. Uh, this morning, we're going to be reading, reading from the book of Luke, chapter 10, starting at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Do you know what the number one complaint from God to his people is? Parents of children will appreciate this. It's that his kids don't listen. 1,500 times in your Bible, the word listen shows up. In uh, the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word shema. Say shema. In the New Testament, it is the Greek word hakuo. Say hakuo. Both of these two words are really, really interesting because it's really difficult for us as English-speaking readers to kind of encapsulate what these two words are seeking to convey. They pack a very powerful punch. In fact, our Jewish friends would tell us that if we were to try to understand the essence of the Shema, it would take not one, but four different words to understand it. There are actually four layers of hearing. So let's just try this out. Uh, the first layer of hearing is something that you hear, but you don't understand it. For instance, I could say to you, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad. And unless you have even a cursory awareness of the Hebrew language, how could you possibly know that I just recited for you Deuteronomy 6? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You can also hear something and understand it, but not be moved by it. I mean, how many people have heard Deuteronomy chapter 6 and thought that it was just written by a bunch of uber-religious people who believe in cloud fairies with big beards? They are in no way, shape, or form moved or impacted by the teaching of Scripture, and so they only have a second layer of hearing. Then there's a third group of people. They hear they understand, and they are moved to trust in it as truth, but they're not actually compelled to live by it in obedience and love. And actually, in a way, this third layer of hearing is what this entire series is all about. Moving from third layer hearing to fourth layer hearing, saying, I believe in Jesus, I trust in him alone for my salvation, but I'm not going to live out my faith in such a way that it moves my feet it moves my mouth that I follow my rabbi Jesus so closely that I'm covered in his dust. And so that leads us to the, th the fourth layer of hearing, where you hear something, you understand it, you are moved to trust it as truth, and now, on account of all of those things, the upshot of all of that is you obey it. You say, this is the truth of my life, and I want to follow it so wholeheartedly, so willingly, that when the Bible says jump, I say how high. I want to be and to abide with Jesus. I want to go where he goes. I want to do what he does. Do you see how that message can be lost when we think of hearing as just to hear with our ears? And in the same way, we have been uh, looking at this quote from uh, Dallas Willard I've shared with you every week. He says this, the governing assumption today among professing Christians is we can be Christians forever and never become disciples never become wholehearted followers of Jesus. And so what I'm kind of laying at your feet for this entire series is how can we move from third layer hearers to fourth layer disciples of Jesus? And then uh, the Greek word hakuo, it's quite similar in that oftentimes it's translated as to obey, but more often than not, it's translated as to hear. Let me give you an example of this from Scripture. Mark chapter 4, the entire chapter is devoted to uh, characterizing and defining this Greek word hakuo, and it's the parable of the sower. 
Maybe you know this story. There's a sower, he's throwing seeds here, there, and everywhere. They're landing all over the place. And it just dawned on me this week that each of the examples actually follow the four layers of hearing in the Shema. I find that really interesting. So the first one is a seed that falls on the ground and the bird snatches it up right away. So it's someone who hears but they don't understand. The evil one, he snatches the gospel. The second layer of hearing is someone who throws the seed on the ground, but then it gets trampled on by men. They have no use of it. They don't care for it. The third layer of hearing is someone who hears that word of God. They receive it with joy, Jesus says. This actually sprouts up and produces fruit, but after a short time, it begins to wither and to fade away because it has no root and it's not wholeheartedly committed to the gospel. And because of the worries of this world, it falls away. And finally, there's the fourth seed that lands in fertile soil. It produces roots and good fruit, and the fruit it produces is 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. And then Jesus ends that whole sequence this way. I find this really interesting. He says, if anyone has ears to hear, that's hakuo, let them hear. So here's a biblical vision for hearing. It is someone who hears with their ears, leads to understanding, which leads to accepting, which leads to obeying. That's a biblical vision of hearing the word of God. And you might even recall last week that uh, I invited the kids to picture the scene in their mind that if your parents came and they told you to clean your room, and at once you received that word with joy and you ran to your room and then you began to think and pray about what it would look like, practically speaking, to clean your room. You invited your friends over and you had a little Bible study about what it would look like to clean your room. And then you even invited your pastor. You said, Pastor, how do I say this in Greek? And I hope, kids, you never forget this and you frustrate your parents to no end with this, that you keep telling them, Catherine, Sue, Domatio. Try it out. Tell me how it goes. Catherine, Sue, Domatio. And the upshot of all of that is if you don't clean your room, what do your parents say? They don't just say you didn't obey. Do they not say you didn't listen? Interesting. So even in our English language, we, we kind of have this understanding of what it means to listen and to hear something. I see parents smiling, looking at their kids, do this, let's pay attention. So here's the upshot of all of that. I think the number one complaint from God to his children is that they don't listen. They're, they're distracted. They've lost focus. They're busy and worried about many things. There's a really fascinating book called The Holy Longing by Robert Rollheiser, and in it he suggests that one of the problems that we're dealing with in our modern day world as Christians is we're just so distracted all the time. In our constant focus on ourselves, our own needs, our own desires, um, maybe the experiences that we want to have, we're just so distracted by so many things that it's hard for us to be attentive to the presence of God in our lives. Here's what he says. We rarely find the time and space to be in touch with the deeper movements inside of and around us. For every kind of reason, good and bad, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. What a thought. It's not that we have anything against God or depth or the spirit. We would like these. It's just that we're habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar. And I think, I think that's really, really compelling. And that's what our text is about today. So now that we've laid the foundation for this series called All In, we've spent the first few weeks talking about what is discipleship. What does it look like, practically speaking, now is where we're going. We're kind of rolling up our sleeves saying, if we want to be the type of Christian where the dust of our rabbi is all over us, what does it look like to do that in our day-to-day life? So from now moving forward... This is kind of the framework for where we're going in this series. You might think about Romans chapter 12. Paul says these words. This is the message translation. Here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Fix your attention on God, and you will be changed from the inside out. So so here's what my hope is for us today. I have one goal, and it is this. To cultivate a hunger within you 
to live an attentive life to the presence of God. To cultivate a hunger within you to live an attentive life to the presence of God. He's already there. He's already in our presence. Are we attentive to that? And to do that, I think there's no better story in the whole Bible, at least in the New Testament, as the story of Mary and Martha. So here's the scene. Jesus decides to have lunch at Martha's house. And you just have to recognize that in the ancient Near East, this is an honor-shame culture. So if anyone of significance comes into your home, there is immense social and cultural pressure for you to perform. Hospitality has to be on point. And then we learn a little bit about Martha. She, uh, she notices Jesus comes, maybe with the rest of his disciples, and she wants to make sure that everything is just so, right? She crosses T's, she dots I's. If you're familiar with Enneagram, she's probably an eight. So those of you who know, you know, right? She, like, she needs control. Everything needs to be perfect, right? You know the type. If you don't know, you're probably an eight. Just letting you know. So she, like, she needs needs that control, right? And m meanwhile, Mary, she's the opposite. She's just go with the flow. She's like, peace out, Martha. I'm going to go sit at the feet of Jesus. And it was socially and culturally inappropriate for Mary to sit, a woman to sit at a man's feet. And yet she's doing it anyway. And here's the upshot of all of that. Martha begins to lose her mind. She loses her joy in serving because Mary isn't serving with her. I'm familiar with this because I have four children, five, seven, nine, and 10. And there are many times in our life in which Julie and I will say, all right, kids, it's time for you to clean the living room. It's time for you to clean your rooms, right? We'll send them off. And I kid you not, every single time, this is a safe place, I'm just letting you know, all right? Every single time, if one kid stops serving, they all fall down like dominoes. Right? Have you ever experienced that? They're like, Mom, they're not helping. Right? Safe place. Thank you for letting me share all of that with you. But that's the upshot, right? So Martha is losing her joy in serving because Mary won't help. And then the climax of this whole scene is now she gets Jesus involved. And she says this, Lord, don't you care? Interesting choice of words that my sister has left me to do the work by myself. Tell her to help me. And I've shared with you before that the word for work is also the word for worship. Interesting play on words there. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but interesting thought experiment. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself while she sits at your feet? Tell her to help me. And then we hear the famous response of Jesus. He says this, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. And so Jesus essentially says, I appreciate all the preparations that you have made, but in doing so, you have missed the most important thing. What is the most important thing? Hang on to that. We'll get to it in just a second. So Jesus lays out two accusations in this, uh, in Martha's heart. He says that she's worried and she's upset. These are two really powerful words. The, the word for worry is the Greek word meritso, which literally means to tear apart something. So Jesus is saying inwardly she's being torn apart. And then the, the word for upset is the word thorobos, which is a word that is typically associated uh, to describe a revolt or an uproar in a city when it's under siege. And Jesus uses both of these words to describe her inner being, what is happening deep within her heart. Her worries are causing her to be torn apart internally and dragged away by distractions. And in doing so, she's missing the main thing. What's the main thing? The presence of Jesus. Jesus is essentially saying, Martha, listen, I, the Lord and the King of the universe, am in your home for a very short time, and you are dragged apart, pulled apart and dragged away by distractions, and on account of all of that, the upshot is you're missing me. You're missing me. 
and therefore missing the whole point. And I would just say that this right here, my opinion, describes why so many Christians in the modern world are experiencing what they're experiencing with their faith. I would argue that right now, more than any other time in human history, we live very fragmented lives. It's very, very hard for us to be focused on any one thing with so many pings and texts and IMs and messages constantly being distracted by so many different things. It's hard for us to be present and available in the here and now, in the flesh, when we have so many different distractions in our lives. And so because of that, just like Martha, it's difficult for us to live with an awareness of the tangible presence of Jesus. And so here's the upshot of all of that. I think most Christians are amazed that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, would come from heaven down to earth and put on flesh and would go to the cross, scorning its shame, and then go to the tomb and on the third day rise again and then ascend into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there he is coming to judge the living and the dead. We look at all of that, and we are amazed. But at exactly the same time, we have so many distractions that rob us from intimacy with that same God who amazes us. So here's a way of thinking about this. I put it this way in your note sheet. The problem is that many Christians live with an awareness of the omnipresence of God, I'll define that in just a second, but lack an awareness of the tangible presence of Jesus in their lives. So when we say omnipresence, what we mean is God is everywhere all the time, right? No matter where we go. We think of numerous passages of scripture that highlight this. Uh, Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go down to the valley, to the valley of Sheol, you are there. You are where ev you are everywhere. Uh, Proverbs 15, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. And so most Christians, we live with an awareness that God is everywhere all the time. We recognize that. We know that. We understand that doctrine. And we see it all. But just like Martha, we don't seem to have an awareness that he's literally in our house. You think about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul says that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Where does the Lord reside? Within us. We have greater intimacy or the capacity for greater intimacy with Jesus than even Martha did. But we don't believe that. We don't believe that. And because of that, we say, I trust that God is everywhere all the time. I just can't walk in the tangible presence of Jesus. And in so doing, we have a Martha heart. He's literally in our room, in our living room, in our house. And it doesn't make a difference. We're still agitated and worried and distracted by many things. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I don't want you to think of the tangible presence of Jesus only as dramatic spiritual encounters, though they do happen, make no mistake. What we're talking about primarily is do you have an attentiveness to the presence of God in your day-to-day, -day, mundane, typical lives? Is it as mundane as Mary sitting at Jesus' feet learning under her master. Do you have that type of perspective that when you wake up in the morning, when you read your Bible, when you go to work, when you have a conversation, when you enjoy a good meal, that you are walking in the tangible presence of Jesus? And I would say that the vast majority of Christians in the U.S. and Canada do not have that sort of perspective. What accounts for that? If that's the case, if that's what we should be experiencing, what accounts for that? I think there are a number of factors, but I think there are two very compelling factors that are at play that are a little bit more recent that I just want to draw your attention to. And the first one is our habits with respect to technology. Now, just so you know, I'm not anti-tech. I got a cell phone in my back pocket. I have a TV with Netflix. Sometimes I use AI for mundane tasks at the office. Like, I, I'm not anti-tech, okay? But here's what I want you to be convinced of in your own mind. 
that we need to be wary of the effects of technology, not because it's so bad, but because it's so good. And because it's so good, it has the capacity to distract us from the great, which is the presence of Jesus. If you like to read, I would love for you to pick up this book called Restless Devices, written by Felicia Wu Song. And uh, she says this, let me read this to you. When our minds are preoccupied with something productive, the areas of the brain that specialize in our capacity to process autobiographical memory, craft a coherent sense of self, and imagine how others are feeling are all muted. She continues, so the great irony is the more we demand of our brains to attend to being productive, the less our brains are able to grow us as persons in key areas of identity construction and empathy. In other words, you need solitude and silence. Kid's favorite word, you need to be bored long enough to figure out who you are, to be creative, and even to love your neighbor and to be an empathetic and compassionate person. And so you might even ask questions like, like why, why is Twitter a rage machine? Like, why is everyone so angry at each other all the time? Could this be part of the, the solution or the answer? Or you might say, why, why is Disney so infatuated with remaking every movie they've ever made as opposed to creating something new, acting as though all the good ideas are gone? Could this be part of the answer? And so we, ha we live in this world in which it's very difficult for us to get a sense of who we are and to be empathetic toward one another when we're constantly consumed with social media and our brain doesn't have downtime. Let me share another piece of research that I, I picked up this week. The largest survey ever conducted on the use of cell phones is a survey that was conducted in Canada 18 months ago, and here's what they discovered. One in three Canadians are showcasing addictive tendencies with respect to digital devices. A third. A third. And so I would propose to you, it's very, very difficult for us to get a sense of where God is leading us, to be attentive to the presence of God when we're getting pings and texts and messages and IMs and we're doom scrolling social media until our eyelids glaze over, we fall asleep, and then we wake up with a ping in the morning and we pick up our phone and we're off to the races. It's very, very difficult for us to get a sense of who we are when we're constantly consuming things. And I think that's just something for us to be wary of. So here's what I learned from pretty much every single article that I read this week. We are more anxious and distracted than we have ever been in recorded history. We live in a Martha age, torn away, ripped apart, and dragged away by worries and distractions. Here's the second factor that I think is at play in our culture today, and it is secularism. Secularism um, is the idea that God and faith is one of many options. It's not anti-faith. It just treats faith similarly to the way that I treat bread at a steakhouse, all right? So once every, let's say, two years, Julie lets me go to a Brazilian steakhouse, my favorite kind of restaurant to go to. If you've been there before, they bring out big slabs of meat filled with juices of salty goodness, all right? Just so good. And then you have this little uh, cup thing, and on the front, it's green, and it says go, and on the back, it's red, and it says stop. And if you want more meat brought to your table, you keep it green. And weird people, sometimes they make it red. I never do that. You just keep it green. You keep the meat coming, all right? But here's how secularism treats faith. Whenever I'm at a Brazilian steakhouse, you see a bar off to the side, and it's full of bread and salads. And you know what I think every time I see one of those? Why do you need that? There's no need for that at a Brazilian steakhouse. And whenever I see people going over there, I have one thought. Rookies. <laughs> Rookies. All right? The bread, it's just there to fill you up so you don't have so much steak. All right? So don't fall for it. It's a ploy. All right? So that's how secularism treats faith. You can have it but it's like bread at a Brazilian steakhouse. You don't need it. Just stick with the meat, all right? And so that's what we're dealing with on an ongoing basis. It's not new. 
It's just powerful in our cultural moment. When all of our energy moves away from a theological vision of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then it begins to get caked onto created things like your job or your money or your success or your influence or your beauty, it's no wonder that it becomes so difficult for us to be attentive to the presence of Jesus because we're consumed with other things. And so in the midst of all of that, Jesus tells Martha, you need to choose the one thing that matters. The one thing that matters. And what is that one thing? Attending to the presence of Jesus. So then I think what we need to ask ourselves is, what does that look like, practically speaking? If we're going to, you know, roll up the sleeves and, and try to get a, a theological vision for what it looks like to be attentive to the presence of Jesus in our day-to-day -day life, what does that look like? I want to give you three things. All right, so here's the first one. Number one, we have to admit, be willing to admit our addiction to the spirit of Martha. A lot of times, I think, we are worried and distracted because we are terrified of being still and figuring out what's inside because it might scare us. A lot of times, maybe for some of us, we don't like being alone because when we're alone, we don't like who we're with. And so we're worried and distracted by many things. And one way to fill the void, to fill that angst, is to constantly be on, to constantly be productive, to constantly be consumed whether it be Netflix or social media or, or even good things like outings with other people, but our brains always need to be fueled by something until we fall asleep. We don't want solitude. We don't want silence. And so we are engaged in the spirit of Martha. And do you know what's so deceptive about this? It's really interesting. Look at Martha. She is not described as some like uber sinful, irreligious, evil person doing evil things. She is literally walking away from Jesus as she ministers to Jesus, all right? She is like an uber-religious, you know, modern-day Christian person. She has more in common with a pastor or a ministry leader at a church, constantly doing stuff, running around like a chicken with her head cut off, like all in the name of Jesus. I want to serve Jesus so wholeheartedly and so faithfully, and yet she's missing him because she has equated working for Jesus and doing these sorts of good deeds with sitting at the feet of her master and learning from him. She doesn't see the difference between those two things. And I think for some of you that resonates. And you say, you know what, I, I think I might have been caught up in that too. And so the first thing we have to do is admit our addiction to the spirit of Martha See, both religious and irreligious people can have a Martha heart. The spirit of Martha is simply this, the sense that the whole world falls on your shoulders. So let me just ask you a question. Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired? Am I explaining your heart? Do you have a sense that this is exactly where you are in this moment? And, and here's how this reveals itself. Two different ways, but actually it's the same thing. You can have an inflated sense of self-importance and self-pride, or you could have a deflated sense of self-hatred and self-loathing. Both of these are a sense like I have to fix something within myself. I have to be productive. I wish I were a better person and constantly consumed inwardly towards yourself. And here's Jesus. He says, aren't you tired? Why don't you lay that down at the foot of the cross? Why don't you give that over to me and then come sit at my feet? And here's what you'll receive. I will not treat you the way that you treat yourself. I'll disciple you in this. But the first thing we have to do is to be willing to admit the addiction to the spirit of Martha. And the second thing I think we have to do, if we're willing to do that, we have to see the second point. We have to recognize the extent of God's love for us. You have to see it. 
You have to know it deep in your bones, deep in your heart. Notice in our text that Jesus says Martha's name twice. And I've shared with you before that the use of the double name, it's kind of like the ancient Near East's version of uh, all caps heart emoji for us today, all right? It's a way of indicating lots of emotion. Typically, when you see a double name, it's also associated with someone weeping or crying or expressing joy. A couple examples. I shared with you a couple weeks ago when David discovers that his son Absalom had died. What does he do? He says, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, my son, my son, seven times. One of the most heart-wrenching, heart-grueling scenes in the entire Bible when David suddenly realizes it's too late. Or you think about Jesus when he's up on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? indicating expressions of emotion. And so here's Jesus. He says, Martha, Martha. Don't, don't think of it as condescending like Martha, Martha. Jesus loves this woman. Martha, Martha, don't you see how much I love you? Before you've done anything at all. Here's the lie of the evil one. Here are all the things that you have to do in order for Jesus to accept you. And Jesus is saying, don't you know, I knit you together in your mother's womb. Before the dawn of time, I created you. I had a plan for you. And my plan for you is not for you to become a human doing, but for you to be a human being who sits at my feet so that I can disciple you and enjoy your presence as you enjoy mine. That's what Jesus wants for you. And he went from heaven to earth to the cross in order to buy you back so that you could be in his presence again. One thing we're going to be talking about later this week, uh, I've been invited to talk with some young, uh, young adults about the doctrine of hell. Well, that's going to be a fun conversation. But one thing that I'm going to be highlighting there is that the difference between heaven and hell is one thing, the presence of Jesus. The presence of Jesus. Do you want to be in the presence of Jesus in light of everything that he has done for you? So then you say, okay, Justin, I, I get that. What does that look like? So I want to use just two examples for us to get a sense of what it would look like to develop an awareness of the tangible presence of Jesus in our mundane day-to-day -day lives. I mentioned a steakhouse, right? So let's talk about steak again because it's my heart language. Lots of fun. Let's do it. So you could imagine someone with a Martha heart and someone with a Mary heart uh, going to a Brazilian steakhouse. The Martha heart is someone who is either a non-Christian or who is a Christian who ha doesn't have a cultivated awareness of Jesus. The Mary heart is someone who is a wholehearted disciple of Jesus, who understands the four layers of the Shema and who wants to walk in the ways of Jesus. So let's Let's just picture this first person. Let's say they're not a Christian. Can they enjoy a good steak? Can they? Of course they can. They can enjoy a good steak and they might look at it and be like, oh, this is so good. And they might be so compelled that they invite the chef to come out so that they can shake his hand and say, thank you so much for what you made. And they'll even give a big fat tip at the end and say, this was such a good meal. But at the end of the day, when the tantalizing of their taste buds begins to go down, if they want to experience that again, they have to go back. They have to go to the steakhouse again and again and again in order to get that kick. And by the way, that's where all addictions start. Addiction to food, addiction to alcohol, addiction to your work, addiction to sex, whatever it is, it's wanting to get that shot again, that experience that once it's gone, it's gone, right? And so you keep coming back to it. But for the Christian for someone with a merry heart, here's how they go into a Brazilian steakhouse. They start, they take that juicy, amazing piece of steak. Can you picture it? Filled with salty goodness. They put it in their mouth, and instantly they go like this. God, you are amazing. You did it again. Not only did you provide food for nourishment, but you gave it flavor. Like, you didn't have to do that. Why did God have to give it flavor? But he did. He gave it flavor because that's the kind of God that you are. God, you are so amazing. Thank you for this gift. Do you see, see what the Christian does? They move past the gift toward the giver of the gift so that they can be and abide in the presence of Jesus. And you can do that in any element of your life. When you rise in the morning, when you enjoy a good meal, when you have a good conversation with people that you care about and they care about you, you can have an awareness of the tangible presence of God and say, God, thank you for this gift. 
Lord, be with me as I have this conversation. Lord, go before me as I go to work today. Lord, give me an awareness of what you want me to do to build up your kingdom. You're walking with him, and he with you. Let me give you one more example. Um, uh, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian when it comes to looking at stars. So I, I got a couple examples for us today. Look at this little guy. Look at this marble. Let's just pretend for a moment that this marble is planet Earth. All right? You're nothing but a speck on this tiny little thing. I want you to get a sense of just how big stars are. And to do that, I brought something with me. Something for my kids. They said I could bring. This represents the sun. There he is, all right? Here's the sun in comparison to Earth. The research I did this week indicates that 1.2 million masses of the Earth would equal the sun. So actually, this is probably too small. It would need to be like twice this size to get an equal proportion. And then I did research to say, like, the sun's actually a very small star. What is one of the largest stars in our galaxy? It's called the UV Scuti. And it is not a hundred and a 1.2 million times the, su the size of the sun. Do you know how big it is in comparison to the sun? Five billion times the size of our sun, which would be the equivalent of the size of this auditorium. Earth, sun, UV Scooty, take a look around. That's how big one star is. Now, let me blow your mind for a second. That's one star. In our galaxy, there are a hundred billion stars like our sun and like UV Scooty. And then, some of you, you might recall, um, I forget what, the, the Hubble telescope in the late 90s. They put Hubble Telescope out, and it pointed in the same direction for a couple of weeks. They collected all the data, and they discovered as they were looking out in one direction that there were approximately 10,000 galaxies just in that one direction. So over the last 25 years, they're trying to get a sense of like how big is the universe, the observable universe to us. And over the last 25 years, here's their best guess to date, that there are between 100 billion and 200 billion galaxies, each with a hundred billion stars. So I did the math this past week. Do you know how many stars that is? It is 15 quintillion stars. That's 18 zeros, if you're curious. Now, here, here's the reason I'm sharing all this with you. All right, so let's picture ourselves. We're going out, we're looking at the stars. Here's how a non-Christian looks at the stars. They go like this. I wonder if aliens exist. Don't they start that way usually? I wonder if aliens, I wonder if there's like intelligence somewhere out there in the world. Wow, 15 quintillion stars. I wonder what made all of that. Was it like a big fart of the universe that created everything? Or like is there an intelligent God who made all of these things? I, I don't know. Anyway, pretty cool. <sighs> That's how a non-Christian might look at the stars. But what does a Christian do when they look at those stars? They go, this is mind-boggling, God, that you would create such a vast universe. Even though, over the course of thousands of years, we can't even get to Mars, let alone to the closest star. And there's trillions upon trillions of them. Wow, God, you are amazing. Just so that we could lay on our back and gaze out and look at these stars. You did all of that for us to, just to show off. You know, just to show how majestic and amazing you are. And you might think of Isaiah 40, which says this. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name. And that same God that we serve who created billions upon billions upon billions of stars, he has the audacity to say this to you. Psalm 56, God says, the psalmist says, you keep track of all of my sorrows. You've collected my tears in a bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. 
That's how God pictures you. That's how God treats you. He loves you that much, and you need to get that awareness deep within your heart, in your bones. You need to grapple with this in your own soul and to ask yourself this question, why do I allow the immediate things of this life to rob me from being attentive to the presence of God who wants me to sit at his feet so that he can disciple me, so that I can be in his presence and he in mine? Why do I choose the Martha heart of being attentive to duties and not the Mary heart who says, I just want to be in the presence of Jesus. That's all I want. And everything else is just details in my life to that one endeavor. What is that one endeavor? To be attentive to Jesus. To be in his presence. To walk with him so closely that the dust of my rabbi Jesus is all over me. And if we had that sort of perspective, I promise you, here's what we're not going to do. We are not going to treat our salvation as some sort of golden ticket we get in heaven. We're going to say, right here, right now, I want, to, I want this. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to wait till I die. Like, I want it now, in this very moment. And that leads to the third and final point. If you believe this, if you have that fourth layer hearing of the Shema, where you want to be in the presence of Jesus, here's what you're going to do. You are going to resolve to seek after God. In everything in your life, you are going to seek after this endeavor. There is a war for your attention, and I promise you, you are not going to naturally drift toward godliness and seeking to walk in the presence of Jesus. That's not just going to happen naturally. You're more like a salmon swimming up the stream. That's the type of attentiveness that you need. You have to cultivate a desire to follow Jesus and to back it up with your actions. You're going to have to determine in your heart that you will be a person who pursues Jesus actively and intentionally in everything that you do. That you say, I'm after God's heart. That's the one thing I want in my life. I'm after his heart. John Piper, he says this, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw and all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? That might sound really, really appealing, but here's the point. None of this is possible without the presence of Jesus. And the greatest thing that we could ever have is the tangible presence of Jesus. And Paul says, ever since that curtain torn in two, we, we sang about it this morning, upon the death of Jesus, when the curtain was torn in two, the Holy Spirit went from the Holy of Holies, the kabod, the glory of God, went from there into you into you. You're the new holy of holies. You're the new house of God. And so what we need to do is not to say, has that happened? Yes, it has happened. Do we just have a cultivated awareness of what is happening in our lives? You need a Mary spirit and a Martha world. Mary got it right. In each of the three instances that we see in Scripture, Mary got it right. We see here that she is sitting at the feet of Jesus when Martha is perplexed and running around. Uh, we saw during Easter, when her brother Lazarus dies, she runs up to Jesus and she kneels at his feet. And the third story, which we often miss, is the story where uh, Mary runs in when there's a large crowd of people and she uh, breaks the alabaster jar at great expense and a lot of people are offended at what she's doing, and she washes Jesus' feet. Scripture says that's Mary of Bethany. It's the same Mary. So all three times we see Mary, she's doing the same thing. She is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And every single time she gets it right when everyone else misses the moment. When everyone else is just too busy and too distracted. They're inwardly torn apart by their worries, and they're dragged away by their distractions. But Mary gets it right. And so my prayer for you as, as we hear this word of God, that God wants us to be attentive to his presence, that we would cultivate an awareness of what Jesus is already doing in your midst, but you're just missing it. But it would be the passion of our heart to do this in every aspect of our lives.